Hi everyone, my name is Johnny. I used to study biology, and I still do as a member of the Royal Society of Biology. And how we as a species exist has always fascinated me, given how, in a very short period of time, we've completely dominated our planet. Where we used to live in tribes, just in the blink of an eye, in evolutionary terms, we now live in rapidly changing social structures, being both globally connected, but perhaps physically more isolated, especially now in 2020. We have entire libraries on the palm of our hands. And despite most of us now stuck at home, I can still, thankfully, speak to you virtually. Our attention spans have shrunk rapidly to just eight seconds, four seconds less than two decades ago. Society is moving fast. And frankly speaking, our brains are not designed for this. And it hurts our resilience. So what is resilience? Psychology today describes it as a quality that allows some people to be knocked down by life and come back stronger than ever. Like mental shock absorbers, resilience enables us to cope with shocks and keep functioning in much the same kind of way as before. To moderate the highs and lows and the tendency to bounce back. Our society recognizes and rewards this trait. But they do, maybe because it's an exception, rather than the rule. We always cheer on the little guy that never gives up. Think of a Rocky movie or the embodiment of the UK in the Battle of Britain in the Second World War. Despite terrible setbacks, the grit to never give up is noble, it's aspirational, it's powerful. It also seems to be that resilience in newer generations is weaker, as suggested from one particular statistic from Jay Shetty. You know, the baby boomers' resilience is at a higher level at 67%, compared to the Gen Z resilience at 37%. That's worrying. So why is that the exception to the rule? You see, we have a Stone Age brain. It's a wonderful piece of machinery, I have to say. We've used it reliably for millions of years, and for each generation, we've survived and adapted to the environment. And it's got some nifty tricks, like fight and flight, responses to respond to, to danger. We are drawn to high-calorie foods to stay alive when food is scarce. We learn the power of conforming to those that are inspiring. And being in a community, a tribe, is important for safety. The brain can be nuanced, too. As psychology today describes, we always used to fear the saber-toothed tiger. But what if the tiger learned to just eat sandwiches? Well then, seeing a sandwich crumb will also instigate the same kind of fear. That's pretty clever, it's a shortcut, a mental shortcut. The challenge is that some of these features, direct or indirect, might also get in the way in the modern world now. Our brain has remained the same, and while humans are very adaptable, especially physically, like the idea of just putting on clothes when it's cold, we need to now put in more effort on our mind too. And it's something that I really needed when I grew up. So my story is simple. From the start, I felt a little bit out of place. My ancient brain just could not compute, could not understand why I was born on the other side of the world in a place called Hong Kong, but then within one month moved to Europe, bouncing along different countries, to Holland, to Germany, and of course now to the UK. My brain is, is Western, I think British, but I look and I think, oh man, I, I, I look different. Uh, my brain, my caveman brain, was shouting, where's your tribe, bro? Like, is this, is this your tribe? You know, are you the odd one out? And I stereotyped myself as a, as a nerd, a goody two-shoes, Chinese kid who likes Jackie Chan, which I still do. And it's my <laughs> but it's that internal negative narrative of myself that was holding me back. It made me very self-conscious, very insecure. My mood changed day by day. I felt lost and my brain overfought. I didn't feel particularly resilient as a kid. And I think it's fair to say a lot of teenagers now probably also feel insecure with their own unique battles. Thankfully, as I grew up, I found sport in this very hall. 
I once accidentally signed up to do rowing because you have to write the initial R, and I actually meant to put rugby, which was also R, right? So, but hey, I joined rowing, which was cool, except I was awful. I fell in the pond on my first day, and in that photo behind me, uh, that's the British Championships. We actually sank about 20 seconds after that photo was taken. So, famous for sinking a boat in the, uh, in the, in the national title. So, that was great. But what I found from that experience was it gave me a routine. It gave me a focus. It gave me a system. You know, six days a week training in my team, in my tribe. The brain can be surprisingly irrational, but in sport, it can be quite simple, black and white. It measures your progress objectively. You're either the fastest or you're not. It doesn't matter who you know or what you look like. It's also reassuring and satisfying how broadly linear it is. The more you put in, the more you get out. And eventually we did, thankfully. In 2009, we did win the national title. But what it did was it condensed the complexity of life, my doubts, my worries, into something simple. But what it also does is it stops delusion. I had a good friend, Stuart Innes, he, who represented Great Britain in the Rio Olympics. He's much better than me. And he has had to overcome a lot himself. And he shared me the theory of the Stocktail Paradox, where blind optimism, just having a good day, is not enough. It needs to be married with reality. Otherwise, it's just delusion, and the brain actually gets less resilient when the good times don't happen, you know, if you feel let down all the time. Resilience is about having a rational and honest conversation with your brain. James Stocktail was the most senior Navy officer from the US that was shot down during Vietnam. And he was taken prisoner for seven years, where he and his peers endured terrible treatment and torture. He survived, and when he returned to the US, he commented it was the blind optimist that didn't make it first. The repeated false dawns, the false hopes actually broke them. So, my first lesson on resilience is that objectively measuring and quantifying life really helped strengthen my resilience and hopefully yours. Breaking down the complexities into something structured with clear, focused, tangible goals helps. So what can be your goals? And how can we quantify them? What makes them realistic? These goals will change over time, and the process of just having something to do is as important as the destination. Indeed, almost more important. You know, how many people have felt lost after spending a lot of time on a specific moment, perhaps organizing a wedding or trying to uh, work on an exam and passing the exam or doing a dissertation deadline? The process matters to engage the brain. And I've certainly done this outside of sport, outside of rowing too. Uh, every day before I sleep, I do a quick review of my day. I ask my highlights and my lowlights. I reflect how things can go better the next day, and I give my day out of 10. And you can see the mood swings over time. And if you're resilient, those mood swings kind of become less varied. Another part of the story is about maintaining the motivation to do these goals. Your brain needs to care. We need a meaningful goal. What might be yours? So continue with the rowing theme. Here's a story about ancient Greece two and a half thousand years ago. The Athenian Senate in Athens voted to put down a rebellion of a vassal state. Basically, another city was unhappy and wanted to be independent. They sent a trireme, which is like a really ancient boat with rowers, to row across the Aegean Sea to instruct the local garrison to slaughter all the rebels and enslave the women and children, quite against the principle of, of Athenian philosophy of justice, actually. A little while later, the Senate kind of sat around and thought, you know, maybe they were just a little bit too harsh and they changed their mind, feeling that their punishment was cruel. And so they had a vote, and then, knowing that they've already sent a messenger to slaughter people, and trying to kind of like redact an email in the modern day, they sent another trireme to chase after the original trireme to go and cancel the instruction. And even though they were a whole day behind, this new trireme achieved it. They rode across the Aegean Sea in record time, why? Because they were motivated. They would eat while they rode. They would only sleep in shifts. And they managed to catch up and stop the slaughter. 
They had a clear goal and a clear motivation. The brain understood the sense of importance, the purpose to save lives. It's tangible. It's simple. And if you've ever worked on something that you're really passionate about, you feel less tired, and it's a superpower. It's the kind of power that we see now every day, from essential workers battling on crazy long shifts during the pandemic. They are our super men and women. So resilience in my second lesson is that you also need meaningful purpose. What replaces the Stone Age brain of needing food and water? It doesn't have to be as grand as crossing a G and C, but it needs to be as tangible, with realistic rules of when and how to achieve it. We need to override our brain from just finding food into something modern. Returning to my story, I found through sport, but also as I got older, that I needed to unlearn things about what I told myself. I may be happier because I was allowed, allowing my brain to override bad internal thoughts about myself. A popular podcaster called Naval Rafikant said, "Sometimes you need to be willing to start from scratch within our inner dialogue. You become more open-minded to change too." You teach your brain to be able to adapt outside of our primal instincts. You see, most people want to start where they are now. Perhaps they're halfway up that mountain. Nobody wants to go back down the mountain and then climb that mountain again, right? People just want to tweak their life or whatever, and then they continue up the mountain, continue up that struggle, to, instead of finding perhaps a better path. The hard part isn't learning. The hard part is unlearning. Because we have to fight against human nature, and being aware that there is more than just the current room, it's what stops us from falling into our echo chambers that we see all the time now. In my example, a few years later now, I found myself running. And I don't know how I do this, but I found myself running a national charity with dozens of staff, and blimey, me, it was a struggle, especially funding-wise. A common story now, of course, but also for those in the charity sector. I had serious imposter syndrome, and I felt unready to make the tough decisions. And I cried a lot, I have to admit, during that time. I did not feel like I had the resilience to cope. I see in my brain, I had this image of what a leader should be: square-jawed, the loudest, the strongest, the most experienced. Definitely not me. I was only 23 at the time. Ah, it was my brain. It was my brain again. It was my caveman brain, where survive the fittest, being the toughest person, should be naturally drawn as the leader, unless you're a certain person. That's not how it works anymore in the 21st century. I found out, of course, by watching TED talks, looking out for role models and mentors, and just talking about the fact that it was hard has helped me learn and unlearn. I found how different people could be leaders. You don't have to have a ruthlessly bad temper to be a good leader. Empathy, kindness, being able to listen—they are leadership qualities too. And you don't always have to be experienced. Even if that helps, if you're a fast learner and unlearner, you can mitigate that. And I'm particularly excited to see younger and younger people lead companies, and in politics. I know another way to decouple the brain is to look at specific problems. My problems, your problems. But in a third-person way, to try and remove the emotional baggage that can come with personal issues, put it aside, maybe write it down in a neutral way, because then you analyze problems without perhaps your own assumptions, your emotional baggage that you get from the caveman brain. And just to let you know, I'm proud that the charity survives and it's still thriving now. I found this as I got through more and more of the problems. Actually, like going to the gym, it hurts at the time, but you get more strong as you become more experienced in dealing with these issues and rationalizing it. So my third lesson on resilience is to learn and unlearn, and sometimes be willing to be more open-minded and unlearn past things which may not be useful now. I want to finish by saying, having a strong resilience is a personal journey. We all work differently. And how we see ourselves is special and unique, and it depends partly on how you were brought up and what challenges you faced. But by understanding that some of these feelings are normal, 
derived from ancient wirings from an ancient brain can help rationalize it. If me, a super shy, quiet guy, can do it, I know anyone can. Our brains have lived in a world where historically there was no margin for failure. If you were different to the herd, you were gone. If you took a risk, it could be over. We don't live in that world anymore. So we have to educate ourselves and perhaps to change the way we speak to ourselves. For me, it was, it was rowing, but it could be anything. Perhaps a video game character which you are player one and you are in control. Or perhaps a character in a book where you are the main antagonist or protagonist. <laughs> Use that locus of control to determine your life outcome. It is that control in yourself over your ancient mind that will give you your resilience. Thank you.